Dang. It's the fact that that timed up perfectly with the countdown that really is the whole crazy thing about it all. So good job on that timing. Hey, um, it, you know, it is every pastor's dream to, wit, to be able to talk to a group of people that miss church on a Sunday morning. And so I just want to say, shame on you guys. That was a test, and you all failed. You weren't at church this morning. So get it together. Um, I'm just kidding. Welcome. If you guys don't know me, my name is Kyle. I'm the student pastor. Um, yes, my fan club back there, I pay them handsomely. And to get us started off this evening, I wanted to play a little game with you guys, if you would indulge me for a little bit. So it's not going to require a lot from you. We're going to go all the way back to the good old day of 2004 and do a little bit of trivia. Uh, and I know 2004 looked a lot different for a lot of different people, and I don't want to make anybody feel bad, but I was in fourth grade in 2004. Um, it was a good year for me. I think I made honor roll. So that was the first and last time I've ever made honor roll. So we're going to play some trivia. I'm going to ask you guys some questions. We'll do some multiple choice and we'll have a good time. Does that sound good? All right. First question is this, who was the 2004 times man of the year? Was it a Bill Gates, B George Bush or C Billy Grimes. Let's go ahead and hear. Let me hear your answers. Shout it out nice and loud. Who are you thinking? A, B, C. Quiet crowd. The correct answer is B, George Bush. If you got that right, good job. Moving on, this one probably a little easier. Who was the 2004 NFL Super Bowl champions? Is it A, the New England Patriots? Boo. Is it B, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Or C, the Panthers, let me hear your answer. Shout them out nice and loud. Yeah, we hate to know it. You're right. It is A, the New England Patriots. If you're a Patriots fan, we have a prayer afterwards that we're willing to offer for you. Next question, which country song was number one in 2004? Good old country. Where are my country people at, country people? Was it A, Alan Jackson's Remember When? I will not be singing these for you. Is it B, Rascal's Flat, Rascal Flat's Mayberry, or C, Tim McGraw, Live Like You Were Dying? What do you think? See, oh, we got some Tim McGraw fans in the house. If you guessed it, you were correct. Tim McGraw. Let's see, our next one. What was the average cost of gas per gallon in 2004? This one is just to make you feel depressed. There's no other reason to put this in here other than to make you depressed. Was it A, $1.99? B, or I'm sorry, 99 cents. Uh, uh, C, $1.92? Or, yep, C, $1.89? Let's see. See, we're going cheap here. It is C, $1.88. Great job, great job. Man, we can all pray and fast for some gas prices like that and see if it comes to fruition. The next, how much did it cost for a stamp in 2004? For you young people, this is how people used to text in 2004. I think this is slightly before AOL really, really hit the scene, so you would need a stamp to do this. How much did it cost? Is it A, 37 cents, B, 34 cents, or C, is it 39 cents? A, B, C, and the answer is A. Congratulations if you got that right. Who's still doing good? Like, who's getting these answers pretty correct? I'm not calling you old. I'm just saying I got the answers right here. I'm doing great. So let's see. Let's uh, go back to the sports category for some of you guys. Who was the 2004 World Series champs? Is it a, the New York Yankees, B, the Boston Red Sox, or C, St. Louis Cardinals. We got some confident people. The answer is B, the Red Sox. As a Yankees fan, it kills me to say it. All right, here we go. Let's step into the realm of technology now. Which of these products did Apple release in 2004? Is it A, the iPod mini, B, iTunes, or C, the iPad? What do you guys think? 2004? 
I'm hearing a lot of mixed answers. The answer is A, iPod Mini. It was a good year. I think it could hold 100 songs, 100 of your best favorite songs, probably all Tim McGraw for some of you. Next is what was the Motor Trend Car of the Year in 2004? Motor Trend Car of the Year. Was it A, the Mini Cooper, B, the Chrysler 300, or C, the Toyota Prius? What do you guys think? Get some A. I hear a lot of A. Let's see. The answer is C. It's the Prius, which I heard that it is also the car of the year this year as well. So they brought it back for a run back on 2024. Who was, who won the Oscar for best picture in 2004? Was it A, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King? B, my kid's favorite, Finding Nemo? Or was it C, Pirates of the Caribbean. What do we think? Oh, we're all over the place on that one. The answer is A. Yeah. All right, you guys are good. Let's see, moving on here, we got the product of the year for 2004. Product of the year. Somebody votes on this stuff and I don't know who it is. 2004, was it the George Foreman Grill? Was it braided carbon fiber thermal barrier? Or was it C, the Instapot? Yeah, you guys are gonna be weirded out by this one, but it is B, which I don't know what that is either. Yeah, I don't know, I asked Ryan and he told me something that I promptly forgot. So let me ask you real quick, we'll put this last slide up, how did you do? Did you do well? Did you get the time traveler? Are you the nostalgia ninja? Maybe you're the memory marvel or the retro rookie. You guys, we're really excited to have a good night with you, and we're um, just grateful that God has been doing what he's been doing for the past years. And so uh, with that said, let's go ahead and stand up and spend some time worshiping together. almost said good morning, but I caught myself and then said it anyway. Hey, good evening, everyone. So glad that you guys could make it. We're excited to be with you. This, uh, this evening, we thought it'd be fun to start out with some songs that were popular back in 2004 when the church started. So we're gonna do a little medley uh, for you this, this afternoon. My guitar is not tuning. One day in your cross, better is one 
sound awesome. All right. It wouldn't be complete without a little Chris Tomlin also, so we're going to do some of that.
You guys can have a seat. I want to wish you a happy birthday, Grace Fellowship Church. Uh, it is great to uh, see that 20 years have gone by and that God continues to work uh, through Grace Fellowship. It's what a, what a delight it is. My name is John Fouché. I'm one of the two founding pastors uh, there. And I worked at Grace Fellowship Church in Johnson City from 95 to 2000, went away to seminary. And while I was at seminary, me and a good friend, Bobby Reynolds, who also was the founding pastor there, uh, were contacted back by Grace Fellowship and, uh, Church in Johnson City. And they said, we've got 80 people driving from Kingsport and uh, 80 people that are driving and they're serving Kingsport. They're doing oil changes for, for people. They're uh, serving the city, and they're just thinking that they really need to be uh, meeting and gathering at a church in Kingsport. And so in 2003, uh, we launched Grace Fellowship Church in Kingsport, met Sullivan North High School. Man, I'll never forget how ugly that auditorium was. <laughs> and some of the people that were key in starting that, Andy Malcolm and Dan Bensing and uh, the uh, just all kinds of people, Eddie Johnson, and Andy Crow, and Mary Crow, uh, just were critical, uh, as well as all these people that were just consistently serving, Don Kasson and uh, the Mitchums, and just all kinds of people. Well, it was a really, really special time. We had an office downtown. Uh, we really didn't know what we were doing, but we kept acting like we were. Uh, and God used that time to really develop a beautiful community and a strong relationally focused uh, church. It was certainly formative for me. One of the things I remember was there was a lot of ups and downs. There were some changes. There were some things that came about 
that I realized that what God was more interested in us just starting an organization was to walking by faith. And there were some of the things that God called us to, some challenges relationally, some challenges facility-wise. Of course, we ended up buying the building you're in in 2006. I've started that process anyway. And what God was really doing was creating a community of faith that you know we struggled through things together we leaned into things together and when i really think back at that time at the community and what was the foundation was laid god loved us so much that he wanted us to walk by faith and that ended up becoming a huge blessing what a great thing it is to see you guys continue to worship today uh it certainly means so much to me that something that was a part of years ago uh continues to last continues to uh, move forward continues to reach people and i just want to thank you guys and wish you a happy birthday gosh i'd hope to see you soon perhaps i can drive over there we can spend time uh, together soon so happy birthday thank you for being faithful i just uh pray that you would be able to say the same things about this church to people 20 years from now uh, your investment of your time of your memories and how it contributed to be able to serve people there in Kings Moore. So good. Uh, hello, check. All right. Hey, it's so good to hear from somebody like John Fouché. For those of you who were not part of the original uh, Grace Fellowship Church, John was one of the original planting pastors, along with Bobby Reynolds, and then later Tommy Rutledge was a part of leadership for the church. And, and we just stand on the backs of men who have led well and women who have led well in our church. And if it were not for them, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, and the same thing is true for the two gentlemen who are standing on stage with me now. Uh, this is Eddie Johnson and Andy Crow. They are some of the original elders and leaders within the church. And we wanted to take a minute as we're thinking about looking back in the life of our church tonight, as well as looking forward to what God may do, we wanted you to hear from these guys. And so, uh, so I'm going to start with just a question for Eddie. And there's going to be a slide that's going to come on the screen for you all to see. It's the first letter that Eddie wrote uh, as a, a member of Grace Fellowship in Johnson City to Fellowship Church in Little Rock and to Grace Johnson City asking and, and telling them about the need to start a church in Kingsport that was like Grace Fellowship Johnson City. And so uh, I want to just ask you guys to both weigh in a little bit. Eddie, for you to start, what led you to get involved in, in wanting to plant a church in Kingsport? You're already engaged with Johnson City, but what was kind of the process of you guys wanting to plant a church here in Kingsport? Thanks, Joel. So my family started going to Grace Fellowship in Johnson City in the year 2000. And C and I knew what type church we were looking for, what we were looking for in a church, and we found it at Grace in Johnson City. The longer we attended Grace Fellowship in Johnson City, the more I started having a hope and desire for a GFC type church in Kingsport. I had several conversations with leaders in Johnson City about a possible church plant to the point they probably got tired of me coming and talking to them on Sunday mornings. The letter on the screen dated March 29, 2002 was the formal request to make the church plant happen. It was addressed to Tom Euler, lead pastor at Grace in Johnson City, and Earl Shute, who was the chairman of the elder board in Johnson City. Johnson City Grace had just been through a revisioning process and they were, they were starting to prioritize and allocate resources and so we knew if we were going to get in on that first prioritization, we needed a formal ask to make that go. And that was, that was the uh, letter. So in my opinion then, a GFC type church would have some essential ingredients. I'll name a couple. Grace field, doctrinally sound, teaching from God's word, contemporary praise and worship music. I think we experienced that. Small groups for encouragement, growth, and nurture and grace motivated good gifts and the com good works in the community and beyond. It would be a church that was building a community of believers in Kingsport to reach the city of Kingsport and beyond. Those hopes and desires for a GFC type church in Kingsport led C and I to get involved in helping to plant Grace Fellowship Church in Kingsport. Yeah, so for me, the uh contrast might be that Eddie was a bit more visionary and a bit more persistent in terms of uh, bringing the idea forward to uh, the leadership at Grace Fellowship in Johnson City. But 
My wife and I had been at Johnson City as well since uh, 1994, I guess, actually before we were married when we started uh, dating was when I got connected to the church. And there were a couple of different things that really uh, motivated us, motivated me to want to be a part of a Grace Fellowship uh, type of church here in Kingsport. And one is the uh, the small group element of the uh, the ministry that takes place. That was something that was truly uh, transformational and life-changing for me just to uh, experience church uh, in people's homes and uh, in a setting where there was maybe a lot of variety amongst the uh, the people that were in those groups, but there was uh, the commonality of, of brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ and just challenging one another. And, and again, it was, uh, it was massive for me personally, and so I wanted to be uh, a part of, of something like that here in Kingsport, despite the fact that there were lots of churches. We felt like there was something uh, uh, unique or newish that could be offered. And then the other part was just around the, uh, that, that missional component of wanting to, to reach the community. Uh, we certainly participated in events um, in Johnson City with Grace Fellowship there, but it always felt like a little bit of a disconnect in terms of the ability to... Uh, bring neighbors or, or um, people that you worked with or whatever. You know, I think Eddie saw some kind of uh, note that I'd made to uh, one of our early family meetings or some kind of discussion where I'd kind of made the comment that it was almost like asking someone uh, to, to come to the moon to go to church. And that sounds a little bit dramatic, but, but there was a sense of reality that to, to take someone that was not in a church possibly and get them to want to come to a uh, a location 30 minutes away, it just seemed very unlikely. And so bringing it here was really a part of what, what we wanted to do. Yeah, that's so great. So the next slide you're going to see is going to be the agreement that was reached between Grace Little Rock uh, or Fellowship Church Little Rock and, and Grace Fellowship in Johnson City and this church as it was getting started. What were some of the energy and the, the kind of just ideas that were happening around that, the excitement that was happening as you knew the church was going to get started? Thanks, Joel. So in May of 2002, there was a Church of Irresistible Influence conference in Little Rock, Arkansas, Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, that several people from Grace Fellowship in Johnson City attended, myself included. I can still vividly remember after a breakout session on church planning, Tom Euler, who was the lead pastor in Johnson City, Dan Benting, who was on the initial elder board, and myself stood up, and Tom looked at us and said, we need to partner with Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock to plant a church in Kingsport. And my fleshly reaction was, Tom, it's about time you figure that out. <laughs> but the spirit filled one that took over was, praise God, what a great idea, let's do it. And so there was a lot of energy at that point. God was definitely at work. In November of 2002, after visits and discussion with Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, Grace and Johnson City, Bobby Reynolds and John Fouché, the decision was made to plant the church, hence the slide you see on the screen. The first half of 2003, a lot happened via teleconference and email. That's all we had. There was no Zoom at the time for what it's worth. So we, to give you a sense, John and Bobby came in the May time frame of 2003, and at that point, things really began to accelerate. So just to give you a sense of what had to be done, public meetings, home meetings, relationship building, so a lot of communication. Hang on. Mission, vision, values, doctrine, elder process, staff roles and responsibilities, higher needed staff, bylaws, 501c3 approval, financial system and controls. Where will we meet on Sunday mornings? Salary and benefits for staff. And then the ministries, so what's the prioritization and scope and sequence? Children's ministry, youth ministry, small groups ministry, women's ministry, men's ministry, outreach ministry. And then the, the part that's mostly seen on Sunday morning, the Sunday morning processes, set up and take down of the church in a box, the black boxes, you still have them around the church is my understanding. Uh, sound, music, PowerPoint, children's processes, and maybe one that is one of the most important ones, who's gonna make the coffee on Sunday morning? <laughs> Absolutely critical. So there were more things that had to be done. I'm not trying to say that was it, but it was a lot to take care of. The thing I remember that was exciting and energizing was God was faithful to bring resources needed, both money 
and people to get done what needed to be done to plant Grace Fellowship Church in, in, King, in Kingsport. That whole time we were getting wise coaching and counsel from Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock and Grace Fellowship Church in Johnson City. I do want to acknowledge the role of Dave McCauley. Many of you may know Dave, who was on staff at Grace in Johnson City at the time. He played a key role in facilitating on the Grace Fellowship side this church plant. He had several, several lunches on the church plant at La Coretta, which is just down the hill from the church. I believe it was God at work in the lives of churches and individuals over many years that led to the church plant in Kingsport. I believe that Grace Fellowship Church was 20 years ago a God thing and still today is a God thing. Working to build a community of believers to reach the community of Kingsport. Yeah, it's so good. And so, the, in other words, all of that to be said is church planting is a lot of work. Yes. And you guys put in the hours and years to make that happen. So. Uh, the next slide you're going to see on the screen is something that took place when some representatives from Fellowship Church in Little Rock and Grace Fellowship Johnson City got together with some of the leaders here, and they, they went on a golf outing, uh, and, and they had an opportunity to, to play golf. And so, Eddie, just as kind of a simple question, what do you remember about that day, and how, how much did you have to struggle in golf to let them beat you so that they would let you plant this church, right? I didn't have to struggle at all. My, <laughs> golf, my golf game is, was so bad then and still is today. People feel good about themselves after they play with me. And I figured that would help with negotiations on the church plant. But all that said, seriously, that's a great relationship building tool. And the relationships that were strengthened between Little Rock, Johnson City, and Kingsport were really key that day. That's and good. it was fun, too. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you're also going to see something on the screen of the a list of names of the first attendees. And I, guys, listen, I realize you can't see what's on the screens very well. A lot of these documents are on a table back in the back of the room, so go check them out when you leave here. Uh, but this is a list of the names of people who came to the first gathering of Grace Fellowship Church Kingsport. And so, Andy, what do you remember about that first gathering? There's excitement about it. There's probably also some concern. How's this going to go? Like, what are your recollections and, and memories of that first gathering time with people coming to Grace Fellowship Kingsport? Yeah, I mean, really the primary thing that I remember is just some excitement about the whole thing. I mean, as Eddie goes through the, the list of all the activities, there was a lot of work. And, and being 20 years older now than I was then, it's, it's tiring just to hear that list. <laughs> uh, but, it, but at the time, you know, there was, it, it, was, it was really exciting and really energizing as well because it, you really could uh, just sense God at work and feel God uh, at, at work and supporting the entire process. And so every one of these um, milestone sorts of, sorts of events, such as that, that first uh, uh, you know, time there was kind of a public, uh, public meeting, public gathering, the energy behind seeing how many people there were interested in exploring uh, this new church, um, just the the affirmation that uh, uh, th this wasn't going to fall on its face, that God had it. Uh, that, th those are the kind of things that stand out the most to me, I think. So good. It's so the, the next thing that you're going to see on the screen is that there was there had to be a list, and Eddie kind of talked about this a minute ago, of where are you going to meet? If you're going to have a church, where do you gather? Where does the fellowship happen? And, and so... Uh, there was a whole list of places. What do you remember, Andy, about choosing a location for the church to gather and what it was like to have that first initial place to have to call home on some level? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really a very open process to begin with. It wasn't even as, uh, as refined as what space is available. It was as open as what space do we think we might consider. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you had conversations based on uh, uh, who kind of made that list, but certainly there were administrative or logistical sorts of things as to, well, what will it look like in terms of a, uh, a worship gathering, or what will it look like in terms of where kids can be or can't be. But the other thing that really stands out to me was there was a lot of intentionality in trying to think through physically where would the church be, uh, who was around that church, and, and you know, what would be the... Um, the, the most immediate community that would that would be a part of the, uh, uh, the the church body potentially and could benefit from the church. So we really spent a lot of time um, evaluating that aspect of things too. It wasn't really, it truly wasn't just uh, uh, the, the first place that we could afford and would say yes, we'll go there. I mean, there was a lot of uh, deliberation, a lot of prayer in the in the whole process. And then Eddie, just kind of last question as we think about this and wrap it up when. 
when you get to that first meeting and people are coming into North High School and gathering, what are, what are you feeling? The joys, the nervousness, the, the energy, the worries, like what kind of things are going through your mind as the church has gotten planted, it's starting up, but what's going to happen next? Yeah, good question. So we had done a preview service a few weeks prior to the initial service on January the 11th. And we were fairly confident that the details we had taken care of. So the, there was one that did service. I went back and looked at elder board meetings, minutes prior to January the 11th, the, the meeting prior to then. And there was one thing that popped up at that point that we needed to be aware of and had to take some quick action. And that was what happens if it snows. And there was a chance it was going to. So who's going to know? Who's going to make the decision? Who's going to know? How are we going to notify people, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Answered prayer: It did not snow. <laughs> so to me, the questions were more like: Would folks be challenged and encouraged to grow in their faith? Would God be glorified in our time of worship together? God had been faithful to get us to the point of launch, and He was going to continue to take us forward. I'm, we were sure of that. Just like a few minutes ago, I am sure I and several others had tears streaming down their face when the worship band cranked up and we sang praises to God at that first service. That's so good, man. I'm just so grateful to you guys both. You know, I said earlier, we stand on the back of the shoulders of those who have gone before us, and these are the guys who went before us. And so when you look out today and you see almost 400 people who are gathered here, some who are current members of our church, others who are uh, members past who have come back for today, we are, we are so thankful to you guys for the work that God did in your hearts to lead you to that place to plant Grace Fellowship Church. And so, church, could you guys just thank them and tell them thank you for the work? Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, appreciate you. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, you can turn it off. Thanks. So good. Hey, we're going to continue to worship together, so I'm going to ask our band to come back up on stage. And then uh, after we do these next couple of songs, you're going to see a video from Tommy Rutledge, who was another previous pastor of Grace Fellowship. And then uh, you're going to also get to hear for in a little while from Jeff Presley, who was the lead elder when I came into the church. And we're going to talk for just a few minutes. And, uh, and so we're going to continue to worship together. Uh, and then let me just let you know this as we're doing this, and they're coming back up on stage. At the end of the night... If you were to come into our office at Grace right now, you would see a picture on the wall in the front office. It's a picture of the one-year anniversary and everybody who was there for the one-year celebration of Grace Fellowship. So tonight, before we finish, we're going to take a picture of the 20th anniversary, and we're going to get everybody in the picture tonight. So stick around to the very end for that. It's going to be great. But if you will, just stand back up. Let's pray together as we continue to worship. And so, God, we just want to say thank you tonight for being so good to us. This is exciting for us to be in this place and to be able to worship your name. God, you have done the hard work to, to build a community of believers in Christ in Kingsport. And we're not the only community you've built. There are churches all around us, God. Churches all over this city worship today. And at some point, they got their start. And so we're grateful for the work that you do to build your church. Jesus, you promised in your word that you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So we just pray as we move into the future that you would stay true to that promise. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. The rock on which 
He's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? He would. He would. He would. God who is so faithful. Amen. We wanted to have some fun and do a hymn. We're going to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. See 
Fellowship Church. Hey, greetings from Asheville, North Carolina. I just heard some news that you guys are turning 20 this year. First of all, just a huge, a huge congrats on hitting that 20-year milestone. Like, what an accomplishment! What a, what an amazing thing God has done. And I'm just, just your labor for the sake of the gospel is remaining and continuing. It's just gonna, and it's gonna continue to deepen. Man, you guys know as well as I do. Our, our culture, no matter where you live now today, just needs good gospel-centered, mission-sending, places of, of great spiritual care to continue to be available. And, I mean, you guys are certainly that. So just want to say a couple things quickly. I just know we think about you guys a lot. Praise God for you. We think about the relationships we were able to form with you when we were there. Also, just GFC's vision alongside Soma to be a disciple-making church. I mean, you probably need to hear it as much as we do. That That's just a worthy calling. It's worthy to give yourselves to as a local body of believers. And just say, uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a beautiful thing. I uh, feel fortunate to have you uh, in the trenches with us. Uh, our kids, believe it or not, we just will be eating a meal. And they'll just, they'll just spontaneously bring up our uh, Kingsport years, the chapter we spent with you. And they just have fond memories and cherish those memories. And I'll just say, Celeste and I, feel the same way as our kids do, as we, as we, as seasons come and go for us, and as we look back on those years, we just feel a debt of gratitude to you, to Grace Fellowship, to Bobby, and that first group of elders that landed us in that part of the country, and we feel like gave us, uh, gave us the start ministry that we had, so just thank you for that. And as I look back on our time spent with you, and what the Lord was up to with my life, some of what marked grace and what stood out to you as a local church. I, th- I think it really, I'll, I would say three things. There's more than this, but man, solid Bible teaching. There's a long history of just good work and handling the scripture, valuing scripture, its proper role and authority in our lives and in the local church. It's God's inerrant word given to the church to nourish us. And that's there. It's still there. It was there when I was there. Um, man, what, what a gift. Um, just the Just the pastoral care as well, that I, I remember just Grace Fellowship being such a caring community, a, a community that um, people genuinely felt cared for when they showed up. And maybe the thing that stands out to me the most was the just the value for outreach. There was this kind of, that was the drum that was beating when I was there. That's one of the reasons why I showed up there was to help move Grace beyond the walls of the church, getting our hands dirty in the community. And I just remember just just a lot of stories of what God did when we were there. And um, I can just tell you that's a true marker of excellence and just not to just not to grow weary in uh, doing good and, and finding ways to be a blessing to your community, staying on that learning curve. And 
And then I, I'll just say, uh, you know, I told Celeste I was going to send you a quick video. And what, what comes to mind, and she immediately brought up um, First, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And I'll just read it to you. She said, or Paul says this, Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. So I just want you to know we're really grateful for you. We're thankful you're only 90 minutes away. And and we often, um, yeah, we're just thankful for the partnership that we feel like we have with you in the gospel over the mountains here. So I hope you hope this celebration is, is just all that, that it needs to be. And uh, you guys blow it out and have a great time and, and just uh, recount God's faithfulness to you. So, yeah, uh, hope to see you soon in 2024. And, um, yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, so there's going to be a video that's going to be showing on the screen, and as part of our 20th anniversary, one of the decisions that we made this year was we wanted to serve our community. We love the city of Kingsport. There was a reason that the church was planted here, and so part of our celebration of 20 years was we wanted to do 20 service projects in our community to take the love of Jesus out into the community. Uh, and as a result of your hard work as individuals, as life groups in different capacities, uh, we've now eclipsed that 20 service projects goal. And uh, there are still more that are going to be done as the, the time comes in the next couple of months. So, uh, man, thank you, church, for the way that you have just loved people well in our community and served our community well. And so that's going to be showing some of the pictures of things while I have this conversation with Jeff Presley. Jeff was the lead elder at Grace Fellowship when I came here to be pastor and was the first person from Grace Fellowship that I had a chance to meet. Uh, his mom lives in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where I was serving at the time. And so Jeff came down to visit her as I was a candidate for the role and uh, came and had dinner with me and my two boys. Heather was working that night, but I had uh, a five-year-old and a three-year-old at the time. And Jeff just jumped in at dinner and helped me out with the kids, and uh, we had a great time. But So Jeff, when we were meeting and you were interviewing me, what lie specifically did I tell that you thought this guy would be a great pastor for this church moving forward? You said go hogs. The first thing you said. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I just love this guy. He's one of my favorite people, and I'm so grateful that you're here tonight, Jeff, to, to share this with us. But um, before I came to Grace, there was a, a period of time where the elders led the church through uh, creating some new vision, new values, uh, new ministry kind of ideas. What was, what was the vision? What was the values? What were uh, the mission of the church? What do you remember about those days and the, the hopes and the excitement that came from just some new things getting started? That's a good question. Um, when I joined the Elder Board, I would say there was not excitement. We had gone through the first five, ten years to grow, to build, to get established. And it was like, huh, okay, we're a church now. We've, 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 we've arrived. And, and I think we got a little complacent. Um, I think we had some relational issues that we needed to address that we did and, and and we became we we almost died there was a time when I know that we struggled like which bill are we going to pay this month uh, or this week uh, we were shrinking in size and it was a it was a dark time um, but God was faithful I want to say is that that he deserves all the glory for what what he led us to there was there was some some humbling and there's some just a lot of growth in terms of, well, what are we here for? What are we about? And I think one of the several key things at that time, one of them was we're an elder-led body. And, and really we are, I mean, it really the priesthood of the believer about how we all have a role. And, and we saw that played out because there was you now a bunch of us teaching. And there was a gaps filled as we were between pastors. So just the body coming together and, and being resilient, that was that was just strengthening there and the support that we had for for those that were still a part of the body was just really crucial to that i think at it, almost at the same time um the discipleship came back yeah. and 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 that was just a huge step forward i know andy brought a lot of vision from um uh, real life uh, i forget the yeah relational discipleship thank network. you yeah. thank you um 
and there are, there's a hundred ways a church can do that, but we, we picked one and we jumped in with both feet and that, that was huge. And then when you came, it was in your heart too. And I think that began a healing process, but it took time. Yeah. It took yeah. a good while. Yeah, absolutely. So now when you think about looking back 20 years of ministry and what Grace has, has accomplished and done, you're at a position now, you and your wife live in Memphis. You're not part of our, our body anymore, but and what do you just see God's faithfulness and the things that you're excited about today, looking at the last 10 years, 20 years, and just what you see happening in the life of Grace Fellowship from a distance? From a distance. Um, a number of things. I, near the end of our time here, when we were back on our feet and things were, we had money in the bank, we had, we had people coming and wanting to be a part, and we were starting to grow again. Um, that was the time the song Holy Spirit had come out, and Joy was always good about playing that one. I would ask him, please play that again, because there's a line in it that just was so strong for me. It's, um, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. And that was us. That was oh, because we had to trust him. We, had, we, we weren't coasting anymore. We had to trust in what he could do only. And um, that was so encouraging. And this it's just really encouraging. Yeah. Um, I, you know, talking about your giving and, and generosity, that's a whole other thing. Generosity Sunday was a part of, of, of turning our direction and the, and, and the giving and what, it's just the goodness of God. Yeah. And, and experience that glory is so wonderful. And it's just good to see all of you. I mean, I don't know any of you, <laughs> but I know your God because he's my God too. And he has been so good to this body and, and bringing Joel, and, and, and I'm, I'm just so grateful. Yeah. Man, well, thank you so much. Like I said, we're so glad you're here tonight to celebrate this time with us. Came all the way from Memphis, Tennessee. Would you guys please give him a hand and say thank you? Thanks so much, Jeff. So you have heard a little bit tonight of some of the, the history of Grace Fellowship Church and what's taken place. And in 2003, 2004, Eddie spoke about this earlier, there was just this idea of saying, hey, we want to build a community to reach a community. That was the whole heart of Grace Fellowship getting started. What Eddie didn't tell you and wouldn't tell you, because uh, he's a humble guy, when we were digging into some things in conversation with other people around the 20th anniversary of our church and talking to people in Johnson City and other places, they said, hey, you know what? If it weren't for Eddie Johnson, Grace Fellowship Church wouldn't exist. He had that much of a heart for this church getting started. And a big part of it was when he said, and Andy kind of alluded to this earlier, he said, you know, it's not so much, because listen, here's what ha was happening at the time. In Grace Johnson City, they had about three other people from different communities around the Tri-Cities coming to them and saying, we want to plant a church in our town. We want to plant a church in our city. Will you help us? Eddie was one of three, and Andy was one of three. And what really got Grace Fellowship Kingsport here was the difference between the approaches of those churches. Several of them were going, we would like a church in our town so we don't have to drive so far to get to a great church. Eddie was saying, Andy was saying, we want a church in our town because we want our unchurched friends to come to a local church with us. The heart of this church started with the desire to reach unchurched people. And so in 2003, that mission statement, that vision, hey, let's be a community to reach a community. And then several years into it, there was kind of a new desire to, to rethink the vision. What are we doing? Where are we going? And so there was this new strategy, this new vision statement that was put in place that we want to be a church that reaches the unchurched by releasing people who love Jesus so passionately that they're irresistible in their influence. And so that governed us and guided us in that vision for how do we do life as a church? What are we about? We want to reach unchurched people by releasing you, people who love Jesus passionately, to go and show how irresistible Jesus is. And that lasted for about 10 years of that vision driving our church. And then just recently, this year, we kind of got back together as the elders and said, it's, it's probably time after 10 years to, to rethink where is God sending us in the future? Here we are celebrating 20 years. So what are the next decade going to look like? What's the vision for the next decade? And, and we've kind of said, hey, we want to be a community that's being transformed by the gospel, who will love and serve where we live, work, and play. 
And that's the vision for us. Like, we want to be a community of people who are continually being transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And as he's transforming us, we go love and serve people all around us right here where we live, work, and play. That's the big picture of what we feel like God's calling us to do. And that's what we feel like is going to lead us into the next 10 years. And so here's the one word, though, that I want us to kind of focus on tonight because we can have vision statements and those things are great and they point us in a direction. But really, the the big thing we want to focus on tonight is this one word it's faithfulness. And we just sang a few minutes ago, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord God our Father, right? He has been so faithful. And so tonight, we part of what we want to do is look back on the faithfulness of God, but we also want to look forward to what God's calling us to do and how we want to be faithful to him. Because as believers in Jesus, we're people who are called to be faithful because God is faithful. He has shown himself faithful over and over and over again. And because of his faithfulness, he calls us to be faithful. And as we move in faithfulness, we see the passion of God to do great work through us. And so I want us to look at one passage of scripture tonight. And talk about this briefly. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25 say this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us then draw near to God with a sincere heart. And with the fullness of assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so there's just a couple of things that I want to highlight here before we close up tonight. Number one is this, that the gospel of Jesus gives us access to God. In the Old Testament, when the people of God wanted to come before God, they had to have a high priest who would go into the Holy of Holies, and he could only do that one time per year to enter into the presence of God. And before he could do that, he would have to go through a process of ritual cleansing and purification and bathing to go into the presence of God and to go behind the curtain and to be in the Holy of Holies where God was and would meet with the high priest. And then when Jesus comes along, Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews here says, that he came and he gave us this new entrance, this new curtain, his body, the blood of Christ that was sacrificed for us, the gospel of Jesus, that he died on our behalf in our place to give us hope. And now we enter into the presence of God, not once a year, not through a high priest, not behind an actual curtain, but as individual people, because of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, through the person of Jesus to come into his presence. And we have access to God through his presence. And then Paul encourages us to hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus because why? He's faithful. And so he actually says, he uses this term in the NIV, it says that we are to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. I mean, I just love that word. It kind of makes me think of, you know, like a a teenager learning to drive, that you're just kind of like, please, stay straight in the thing. Don't swerve. Don't veer left, right, whatever. Stay in the middle. Drive down the path. Don't swerve. Don't move from one path to the next. Like, stay moving with forward momentum in the direction that God's called us in. And he says, you hold on to the faith unswervingly because God is faithful. He who promised is faithful. He will keep all of his promises. And then number three, we see this. And he says, because God is faithful, what's our responsibility? Well, we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, but being impassioned about the gospel. And all the more as we see the day of Christ approaching. Church, listen, Jesus is coming back. And until he comes, we have this command to stay together in unity, to fellowship, to gather, to be one in Christ, and not to give up meeting together, to encourage one another, to spur each other on toward love and good deeds, that there is great work that's been done in the life of our church. 
Incredible things we can point to in the 20 years past. But let me tell you guys something. There are awesome things that God still has for us for our future. There are things that he is wanting to do and will do and accomplish through us as we stay true to the power of the gospel and we do not give up meeting together and we encourage one another daily. And the more we get closer to the return of Christ, that we keep pushing each other, share the gospel, tell your lost friends about Jesus, encourage others to know him, be impassioned by the gospel message, serve and love where you live, work, and play. Take Jesus with you to work. Take him with you into your community. Take him with you to your schools. Take him with you to the grocery store, like love and serve people everywhere you go. And keep encouraging each other toward that. We get to run this race and be passionate about the things of Jesus. Now here's what I want us to to see tonight. We are celebrating what God has done, but we're standing in anticipation of what he will do. Right, we're 20 years old. I kind of was making a joke last night with some people, and I said, next year when we turn 21, we can start using real wine for communion. That'll be our 21st birthday. That's where we're moving. No more grape juice, baby. We're 21 now. Some of y'all are excited about that. Others of you might leave the church over that. Don't go anywhere. But here's what I want us to see. Like, I know where we are. We're 20 years old. But I think we need to get a picture in our mind of what it will look like when we're 50 years old, when we're 75 years old, when we're 100 years old. I was talking to John Luffy tonight. His parents are here in the room somewhere. You guys raise your hand. I don't know where you are back in the back. They're wearing T-shirts because tonight, as we celebrate turning 20, the church that they go to this morning turned 100. That's awesome. That's good. Hey, Grace Fellowship Kingsport, what will God do through us in the next 80 years as we love and serve where we live, work, and play, as we share the gospel, as we move forward? God has done great things. There are great things ahead. Let's keep hanging in there. Let's keep moving forward. Let's have a vision for where we're going as we move into the future because the best is yet to come. I mean, think about it. How many people will accept Jesus and be baptized in the next 20 years? How many people will be discipled in the next 20 years? How many people will find love and belonging in this community of faith in the next 20 years? How many marriages will be saved in the next 20 years? How many addictions will be broken in the next 20 years? What will God do as we stay faithful to him? 20 years ago, I wonder how many guys as they were talking about the planting of the church would have thought that Grace Fellowship in 2024 would have missions, connections in seven countries around the world. That we would have an orphanage in India named after us that we fully fund and support as a church. That we would have tallied thousands of hours of community service here in the city of Kingsport that we would have a role in helping disciple churches across the country and to make disciples through the Relational Discipleship Network, that we would give away hundreds of thousands of dollars through Generosity Sunday efforts. Like if you could have dreamed 20 years ago what the church would look like, would you have envisioned those kinds of things? So what does the next 20 years look like? God has big things in store for us. And guess what? The best is yet to come. And I don't have a crystal ball that we can look into and predict the future, and I haven't had the voice of the Holy Spirit whisper prophetically to me to say, here's what you're going to experience. But just imagine some things, church. As we continue to grow, as we continue to see our parking lot every Sunday filled and cars filled and parking along the sides and children's ministry spaces filled and our worship services filled, imagine what it might look like in the future to have a third worship service so we can continue to reach more people. Imagine what it might look like into the future to have a different meeting location where we have a larger facility where we can continue to equip and build people and send people out and reach our community. Imagine what it will look like if we think about the possibility of planting another church. I mean, what does God have for our future? There are some incredible things that we can be dreaming about and thinking about what might God do in the next 20 years. So this past week, when I was meeting with the guys that I disciple, 
And we were sitting around just talking about the gospel of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 9. Tomorrow night I'll meet with my guys again. We'll be in Matthew chapter 10. And as I'm discipling them and investing in them and they're pouring into me and giving me parts of their life to, to see what God's doing, here's what we read last week. Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said this. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Hey, that's what we're here to think about tonight. And as we close, and we're going to do one more worship song, I think I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and we're going to sing one last time to close our time up together tonight. But I want you just to think about this as we start to close up. What does it look like to be a church that's primed to send out workers into the harvest field? That Jesus has promised us the harvest is plentiful. I think sometimes because of where we live, we kind of think, well, everybody around here is a Christian. Everybody in my community is a Christian. Everybody in my cul-de-sac is a Christian. Everybody at my work is a Christian. Everybody goes to church. Everybody's a Christian. Hey, Grace Fellowship, that's not true. There are lost people all around us. And part of what God is doing is calling us to go out into the harvest fields. And he's promised us, if we take the gospel, that the harvest is plentiful. It's just that the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers out in his field. So here's how I want to pray and close our time tonight before we worship one last time. And then, like I said earlier, please don't move from your seats because when we're done, we're going to take one quick picture and then we're going to start breaking stuff down. I'll give some instructions about that at the end. But stay where you are when we finish singing this last song. But I just want to pray that God uses us to go out into the harvest field and to share the gospel of Jesus clearly, to love people with a passion, to continue that mission of 20 years ago, that vision of 20 years ago, be a community that builds a community of faith here in Kingsport. Reach the unchurched by loving people Let's be the kind of church that asks God, send us out to take the gospel message. So if you will, would you just pray with me? Father God, I just want to say thank you for this night. Thank you for the chance to reflect on 20 years of ministry, to think about what you've done over the last 20 years, and to be excited about what you will do. God, we still believe the best days for our church are in front of us. They're yet to come. We're leaning into that. But God, I pray that you would give us a burden for people who don't know Jesus, and that we would be willing participants in the gospel to carry Jesus with us where we live, work, and play, that we will love and serve people so well and so much that they are anxious to know about the God that we serve, and that we're unashamed, unembarrassed, unafraid to share Jesus with other people. So God, fill us with a passion for that. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath but I got my own giants oh God my God I need you oh God my
continue to be with us as we move forward into the future, God. We thank you for this family. We thank you for all that you've done over the years, and Lord, it's just a blessing and an honor to be part of such an amazing uh, group of people who love and serve and just desire to be with you, God. We just thank you and we give you all the praise in your name. Amen. Is this on? Hey, if you will, stay put really quick. We're going to get a photograph of tonight. Well, we're going to ask, if you're in the front two rows, can you guys kind of fill in some of the space in the middle? If you're in the very back, can you kind of come in and fill in some space in the middle? And we're going to get a picture in just a minute. If you guys can hang out for one second, we're going to do that quickly. Then, last thing, if you have the ability to stick around and help us break some stuff down, we would love for you to do that. We'll have a meeting right up here at the front when we're done. <laughs> 